started Make Life Fun podcast because I needed more fun in my life. When I became a mother, I, for some reason, just put on this like high ponytail, mom jeans, and nose to the ground. I wasn't having fun. It wasn't until I started having fun that it started becoming easy. Fun and mental health go hand in hand for me. I've been in this mental health game my whole life. <laughs> and I am so lit up to like help other people. I'm so lit up for other people to experience this because it's what my wish and my mission is for every woman is to find safety within themselves because it took me a long time to get here. So welcome back, Soul Family, to the Make Life Fun podcast. I am so happy to have you back with us today. Today, I have Rachel Cervelli on the podcast. Rachel, welcome. Thank you. Excited to be here. Yes, I'm so excited to have this wonderful conversation about doodling, journaling, self-acceptance with you today. Before we jump in, I would love you to tell us a little bit about you. So I am a mom of two. I know we're moms listening out there. I did not used to be an entrepreneur in business, but journey into motherhood kind of got me into that because I realized the first few months when I was staying at home with my daughter, I I thought I was just going to be a crafter, a homesteader and having my baby and doing the dream life. It's what I had built in my head for years and my husband and I had saved up and set everything up for it. And then a few months into it, I realized, wait a minute, this doesn't actually make me happy. Like I, I still liked crafting and homesteading, but I felt bored. Isn't really a full way to describe it, but that's one way to describe it. And so because I really think self-acceptance is important, I started sitting with myself, giving myself time, reflecting, trying to figure out, okay, what is going on? And some of it was, I was in a period of grief because my mom had passed away recently. And some of it was, I just wasn't intellectually stimulated. I didn't feel super jazzed up and excited. I mean, I had cool things going on, but they were either so long of a project or not ongoing, interesting. And babies, they don't really like do a whole lot per se. And so I just started getting really compassionate and honest with myself. And I thought, you know, I had this vision of what I was going to do and I'm going to change that because this isn't working. We all need to be happy. And from that, I started, first I started freelancing and then I became an organic garden coach because I love talking gardening with others. And then that slowly transitioned into what I do now, which is supporting people to grow in creativity. It's mostly women, but men too like to be creative. We're all creative, I believe. Life, you know, has different twists and turns, but I think when we keep on returning to self-love and self-acceptance and and with compassion, tune back in and say, okay, what's going on? What do I need? What's not working? Those type of questions can really help us to reflect on, okay, what, what do I need to change, if anything? My gosh, thank you for sharing that with us. And that big piece of coming back to like, what do I want? Like, this is the dream that I had for myself, this vision. I even saved up for it. Mm -hmm. And then giving yourself that grace, that permission to be like, you know what? This isn't working. Yes. It's amazing because it's hard for us, I think, to to do that because we're like, we had a plan. Exactly. I really thought the plan would be everything I wanted and more in the years that we were building up to that plan. It was, it was a driving force. It made me excited. It made me happy. So that was a good part to it, but I had to be honest that once I was there, I just realized, oh, I didn't picture that I, this would be lonelier than I thought it would be. Mm-hmm. or that I would need to find time to write and be creative in a way that I couldn't do with my kids underfoot. I mean, maybe you can sometimes, but I also know that that was the other thing that I realized and probably moms in your community, some will relate to this too, of if I don't have some time just for me, that's only what I want to do. And usually that's some type of creative something or good conversation, then I'm just, after a while, it's like the joy drains out of my life pretty much. Yeah. So finding those moments of times for yourself. And Mm -hmm. I love how you're speaking to like the biggest thing when you were speaking that caught my heart is giving yourself that permission 
permission yes. to pivot, permission to change, permission to have a new idea, a new thought, even, and also permission to enjoy the process. Like you were yes. saying, like it was the driving force that kept you excited. And that's amazing. So we should enjoy the process as we're getting to where we're going, because sometimes when we get to where we're going, it's not even what we envisioned it to be. Exactly. Exactly. And I love to, I don't want to think, oh, those were wasted years. And what a bad choice I made. <laughs> That's not really helpful to anyone. Right. And whether some of the things we're talking about, whether you can do it by just looking at your own thoughts, I spend a lot of time in my head, but also journaling and getting things on paper can help you to not just rattle around in your head and go in circles. But when you see it on paper, you can start to think, okay, what is going on? Because when I first realized that I was not really having fun in this early motherhood stage, I would make lists of, well, first I'd make lists of what am I going to do with my free time? What if I only have two hours? Let's say, what can I do in two hours that fills up my cup so that I feel really good? And I wanted to have a list because what would happen is I would get to the free time and then I would spend 20 minutes trying to figure out what to do. And meanwhile, I'm thinking, I only have an hour plus before I have to get my daughter again. You're right. The permission part of it was huge because even though we had budgeted for me to stay at home, we hadn't budgeted for a babysitter and we were on one income at this point. But around the six month mark, when my daughter was six months old, I told my husband, I need to get a babysitter. I said, look, even like federal laws, if you're an employee who works 40 hours a week, you get an hour lunch break. <laughs> and my daughter, she stopped napping. And so I didn't have nap time anymore. Mm -hmm. And I thought this was unheard of. I was kind of like, wait, you're allowed to do that as a baby? Like somebody tell this kid, she's not allowed to stop because every other baby at six months and nine months is still <laughs> napping. Mm -hmm. But she did not get that memo. <laughs> and I just felt like, look, I have a right to a break. I knew that I did. And even though we had to tweak our budget a little bit, I, through my network, found a sitter who worked with my budget and, and actually she brought her kid. It was perfect. And so she would take my daughter for three hours. And first I would just sit there and lounge and read and write. And then I started thinking, no, like I want to do something. And so, yeah, then I started the freelancing, but it really did take not only giving myself permission, but having the conversation with my husband, Hey, we didn't plan for this, but this is important. And now we're going to set aside X amount per week going on forever. Like we were always going to have a sitter and we each need to make sure we're taking time. And I know not everybody needs that alone time, but I'm an introvert and I, I know that about myself and I know I need time to recharge. That's just for me. Oh, what you're saying is huge. All of it, getting that sitter, having that conversation with your husband, knowing you that you need that alone time. So you first have to like ask your, like come back and asking yourself, like, what is it that I need? And recently I had to have that deep thought, deep conversation too, because I've been doing this podcast with Everett on my lap and it was working for a period of time, but now he's 11 months <laughs> and oh, yeah. he doesn't want to <laughs> sit and look and hang out anymore. He's like, I want to run around. I want to get into everything. So I had to have that conversation. I need help. I didn't grow up seeing my mom ask for help. She had five of us and mm -hmm. I don't know, oh my gosh, how she did it, but she did not ask for help. She just did it. And I still think she's like a unicorn of some sort. Like how? Because yeah. Yeah, you have to ask for that help and you have to get real and honest with yourself and mm -hmm. reach out. I'm one of five too. And similarly, I, I think my mom did ask for help somewhat, but I also know it seemed like she was definitely tired a lot. Mm -hmm. The help she was asking for, I don't know if my siblings and I would do it. So sometimes she might ask us to clean, you know, pick up our room or whatever. And so she would ask, but maybe there, I don't know if she just didn't enforce it or what. I definitely had to learn for myself, okay, it's okay to ask, mm -hmm. even if I don't see anyone else doing it. Mm -hmm. And here's a wild thing. A couple of years back in this book club that I used to be a member of, I've since moved, but they're lovely people. We were all hanging out and we were talking about what we were letting go for the year and mm -hmm. what we were 
wanting to receive mm -hmm. in place of what we we're letting go. And I said something about being willing to ask for help. And a couple people later told me that that was a big deal. And then a few months after that, I had a moment where I had to ask for help, even though I wasn't comfortable about it. And I did it again. So I asked for help and I told my book club friends. And again, people told me, seeing you do that was so inspirational. And in my mind, I'm thinking I'm just doing it for me. But I want to remind all the moms out there, every time we do it, there is this ripple effect that is so profound. And there's probably people who aren't telling us that, oh, this inspired me, but it's like, you're teaching your kids. You're, if you have a partner, you're showing them your friends are being inspired sometimes maybe even in a jealous way at first, but hopefully they'll come around and be like, okay, if she can have it, I can have it. Right. And, and finding that way to to acknowledge that we don't have to all do this alone. I mean, for thousands of years, mm -hmm. raising children was not this solo or almost solo thing with just one or two adults doing it. We had lots of people helping. I always try and remember that. And I think, especially the last few years, the pandemic, I feel like my children have emotionally not handled it all so great. <laughs> and so we've had a counselor for my one child, an occupational therapist for my other. Sometimes I tell my husband, I feel like we're training for the Olympics with like how many support people we have for my children. <laughs> I acknowledge like there's also an amount of privilege in that we have money to put to these things, but we're choosing to put money towards it. And I know a lot of places, even if you don't have all the income, there are publicly funded things that can support you. So yes. if you need resources, like look for them. Yes. Oh, I love that you're speaking to this. Just yesterday I was watching, <laughs> I was watching on YouTube how Beyonce for say, how she mm -hmm. has like a person to help her child speak French. She has a person Ooh. to help them drive her to school. She has a confidence coach. She has all these things in place. And I was thinking to myself, why does nobody ever talk about any of this? Mm -hmm. Like, exactly. Why not? Like when I heard it, my husband was like, that's a lot. And I was like, no, but that's genius because we all need support, not just us as moms, but our children too. Exactly, exactly. Well, and it makes me think a few of the people when I first started coaching, I was a little bit wondering, how are people getting something different from me than they might get like from their best friend, for example, mm -hmm. and that's a valid question. Yeah. And sometimes there is a little bit of that. But the extra bit is one, if your best friend's going through a hard time, she might not have all the capacity to listen to your mm -hmm. hard stuff. And then two, if me or another coach or therapist is coming, we don't have an objective outside of 100% supporting mm -hmm. you with whatever you come to that yes. session with. And same thing, like with all the people Beyonce hired, the French teacher for her daughter doesn't have to worry what's for dinner tonight. Are there enough gas in the car to take the kids to school? Did so-and-so finish her math homework? Like her only thing is French. And so she can really like pour into the child in that way. And I think it's really amazing when we can say I'm valuable enough that whatever it is that I want to do, it's worth it for me to support it in that way. Yeah. You know, like this, the people listening, it's like, this is a community where you've said it's worth it to me that motherhood should be fun. And yes. I, I think so, because we're going to be doing it for quite a while. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. When you were saying like the first six months of motherhood, I literally lost myself for a moment. Mm. I was just like nose to the ground and I'm a mother now. So this means that it's going to be hard and this is how it is. And I'm not going to ask for help. I'm just going to do everything by myself. And then I was I was like lost at sea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then it was going outside and doing the things that were pleasurable to me before I had a kid with him mm -hmm. along. So I was going in the same direction with my life, but he was right there with me. Whereas before I had this cloud that was like, no, this is, it has to all change and be this way now. And so it's just, it's just such a shift in your mind to think I can have fun in motherhood. I can make yes. it what I need it to be. Yes, exactly. Exactly. We had talked about me talking about doodling and journaling. Absolutely. So I want to bring up to me, those are two of my favorite forms of being creative because 
I can do it with very little supplies. As long as I have a pen and paper, <laughs> I can do it. And so I think it's access accessible to anyone. And you can use markers if you want. I use those sometimes. What you were just saying was making me think about this statistic about creativity. So if you ask the average kindergartner or second grader, do they think they're creative? 95% of the kids will raise their hand and say yes. And then if you ask the average fifth grader, 50% will raise their hand and oh. say yes. Yeah. And then get this, if you ask the average senior, so 12th grader in high school, are you creative? Five percent of the class will raise their hand and that's it and wow. and i'm not trying to knock the school system i used to be a public school teacher and i know teachers are doing their best but we aren't actually teaching people to be creative we're doing the opposite and so what you were saying made me think about it's almost when we're entering into motherhood or when we're deciding okay i want motherhood to be fun we have to put our creative thinking cap or our creative lenses on again and start looking at the world in a new way. And then it's almost like that fairy tale with the little breadcrumbs along the path. You start seeing little bits here and little bits there. And then before you know it, you're like, everything is fun, <laughs> except for potty training. I haven't figured out how to make that fun yet, but oh, maybe one day. <laughs> but the more you start to look for examples, if you want to try out doodling or journaling, I would say get out a journal. It doesn't have to be fancy, although it is fun to pick out a nice journal that makes you super excited. And you could just put at the top of the page the question, what would make motherhood more fun for me? And then just free write. Maybe the first day you only come up with three things and half of them involve like, ugh. This is impossible. Like, I'm not a millionaire. I'm not a whatever. Like, maybe the first day you don't come up with much, but maybe the next day you take a walk or you do a workout or you do a nice meditation and then try and write, How can I make motherhood more fun? And maybe you'll realize, Oh, I need to play more music during the day or actually wear my nice shirt, even if it's going to get dirty. But it's my favorite shirt, so I want to wear it. Oh, that's so true. And I love that question. What would make motherhood fun for me? And just mm -hmm. kind of riffing off of that. Or mm -hmm. even what did I do before motherhood that was fun? Yes, exactly. That's where I had to go back to because mm -hmm. I didn't know what fun looked like in motherhood because I yeah. never really seen it. I've just been hearing the stories about hard and how your life will never be the same. <laughs> so I had to go back and find evidence of like fun, Josie, where are you? and right. start to bring that into my parenting mm -hmm. exactly i love that and you know i know you mentioned this but i'm going to hit it home again of yes. the for me part of the question so some people i know love building force with their kids i don't know why but i don't really like it i think it's being under there i start to feel like there's not enough airflow i don't know so my kids they love building force. And I tell them, you can do that with your dad. You can do that with a babysitter, but not with me. That's not my thing. When I was first just having one child, I didn't give myself permission to say no to certain activities. I kind of thought I'm the mom. I have to be here for everything. And I have to be available for any activity my daughter wants to do. And then I realized, oh, what if I just choose like three or four activities that we both really enjoy that those are the things I always will say yes to mm. as long as I have the ability to say yes. But then I can also say no to the things that I really don't like to do. Mm. So reading books, I will always say yes to that because I love children's books and I love reading and doing dance class or music class, those types of things with my kids, I will always say yes. But building forts, eh, that's not really my thing. Wrestling, not my thing. And I just say no, and they know that about me. And maybe the first few times they complain, but then it's like, they know, okay, mom doesn't do that, but she will go all in on these other things that are fun for her and that are fun for the kids. Yeah, I love that because you think, as a mom, you have to say yes to all the things the kids mm -hmm. want to do. Like, you want to build a fort? Okay, I guess I'm free. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> but to give yourself permission to make that decision of mom will do these exciting things with you and she will be full heartedly in. And mm -hmm. then when she doesn't want to build a fort, she's going to say no, not today or ever. <laughs> yes. I want to do that with you. And give again, giving yourself that permission and teaching your kids that they can do the same. 
Exactly. And when they reach a certain age, it also helps them see, oh, I can make a fort by myself. I don't need mom to do it. When I was taking the music classes with my daughter, at first I thought it was a little bit silly. Why am I doing music classes with the? Because we started, I think, when she was eight or nine months old. But it was a free class and I went and then I was totally hooked. And I thought, I don't even care. I know that probably the science backs all the development, but I'm having fun and that's why I'm here. <laughs> and the teacher, one of the things I loved about her was she would remind us to model for the kids taking a break and resting and that it was okay to say, no, I'm not gonna play with you right now while this song plays, this four minute song or whatever, you can look at a book, you can play over here. I'm gonna do my own thing. And so she would have us all practice that every week. And my daughter, so from eight or nine months, got used to me saying no here for this, you know, short period of time, you're gonna do your own thing. And by the time she was one and a half and two, friends were saying, hey, how do you get your daughter to play by herself for 30 minutes? And I was like, well, I don't know, just go tell her to do it. But it, it was one of those things we had built up over a period of time. It does feel weird at first to say, no, I'm not going to play with you, right? Because yeah. you feel like, oh, I'm just cruel. <laughs> but at the end of the day, it's, it's good for both of you to have those boundaries and that communication and the balance. Mm -hmm, absolutely. 100%. I agree with that. I read a book. I can't even remember what it was about giving your kid alone time. So even when Everett was a newborn, I would put him in his room and he would be under the mobile and yeah. he would just hang out and I would go make myself a cup of tea or I wouldn't be far. I'd still yes. be checking in on him. And to this day, I could be sitting on the couch reading a book and he goes and plays. And when he needs my attention, he comes up to me and I'm just like, this is amazing. <laughs> it is. It is. And you know, it's also good too, because, oh, also I'm sure must be showing them, oh, mom doesn't feel like she has to be there every minute. Mm -hmm. So it must be safe for me to play by myself in my yeah. room or to lay in my bed by myself. And I will say it was, I don't know why, but my second child did not take to this easily. <laughs> we, we finally got there and he's, he's three, but maybe for him, there was almost always someone there more mm -hmm. often because he had his older sibling yeah. and he, he didn't seem to like the music classes as much. And so I didn't keep him in there because I, even though I was having fun after a while, I was like, this is clearly I'm the only one I don't have any fun. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so that too, cause I only have one right now. So hearing mm -hmm. that, that the second child may not take that same pathway. Yes. What worked for one may not work for the yes. other child. It's so true. And that has caused me to have a lot of second guessing of myself and reflection. But my journal that I use, sometimes I'll journal like, here's what happened or venting and mm -hmm. what people might think of a, as a typical journal. And other times it's lists and brainstorming. And so my journal is almost like a chronological documenting of my life of all the ups and downs and ins and outs. And my son has had a lot of sleep issues since he was born. And so in my journal, I would make lists of what are the five things I can try, 10 things I can try to help get him to sleep. And then I would try as many of those as I could. And then a couple months would go by and I'd make a new list again. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it was the making the list made me feel like I had more options. Mm -hmm. And I think it was also tapping back into that creativity, but there've been a lot of times raising him where I have really felt like I came up empty with, I don't know what to do and things are really, really hard. But after I reach that point, and sometimes I'll even write in my journal, I don't know what to do. He's driving me crazy. I can't do this anymore but just pouring that out, releasing that and surrendering and then crying usually too. And then the next day I'll have had some sleep, maybe <laughs> I'll, I'll have had some space from that day's emotions and I'll make my list. Okay. What are some things I can do? If I can't get him to sleep, how can I make my life better? And it has really helped a lot to keep me going through what has been 
a long and difficult experience and maybe we're getting to the end of it. I have no idea. We're st he's still not a great sleeper. And we've seen a professional, like the pediatric sleep doctor, the last visit was like, I don't know, just come back in two months. And so it's not even just like, I don't know what to do. The professionals are even like, eh, we don't know right now. But knowing that, okay, I've been working on this problem for a couple of years, we keep on brainstorming, we keep on being creative, I keep on venting in my journal. It gives me this place of, at least I'm trying everything. Yeah. I don't question myself anymore. Like I, I was for quite a while wondering like, what am I not doing? And now I just think, well, I'm doing everything that I can. I'm doing the best that I can. He's really deepened my ability to <laughs> deal with challenging situations yeah. that there's no immediate solution to. Yes. So come back to that self-acceptance piece again. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm doing the best I can. I'm making these lists and that's giving me comfort because I can look and see all the things I'm trying and exactly. I can keep trying new things. And you're talking about journaling as a way to get all the venting. And so for mm -hmm. me, when I was doing that type of journaling, <laughs> for some reason, I couldn't go back and read that. Oh like, yeah. I don't go back and read the bad entries. <laughs> I used to vent, 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 and then I would go back and read them like a few days later, and I was just like, ooh, who is this person? <laughs> <laughs> and so I love that you say that you don't go back and read those, because I, I just stopped venting, actually, in my journal, and I'm sure it was, I'm sure it's helpful to release that emotion, because mm. you have to let it go somehow. Exactly. And getting pen to paper, I know it's magic, so, mm -hmm. so I love that you're speaking to, it's okay to like say what truly you are feeling to your yes. journal. Yes, it is. And to connect to the doodling part, so for me, I use the doodling to put pictures and colors and think about the things that I do want. Mm -hmm. So even as I'm saying this, I'm thinking, gosh, I could make a little drawing for my son for his bedroom that's like sweet dreams all night long, little kiddo. I haven't done a doodle for him. Usually they're for me. So I might put an affirmation or a question like the one I shared before of how can I make motherhood more fun? I might put that on a sheet of eight by 11 paper and then put some flowers or some swirls or spirals over it and then put it up every day it, it's kind of like i make myself a poster and put them around different places of the house and i see it a couple of times a day and that helps me to feel good and i think the fact that it's written by me so it's handmade that's that's kind of fun and it's super easy and as soon as i feel like okay did that thing then I put up a new poster with, okay, here's the thing I'm working on now. Yeah, so that's like a love letter to yourself when you're yes. saying it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love that. I love the doodling. I find that when I am like bored, for mm -hmm. example, I'm taking a class or I'm having a conversation, I kind of let myself doodle and mm -hmm. I've never put it up anywhere or done anything with it. But I love that idea of like, decorating your affirmation and putting it up somewhere where you could see it visually. And I think that subconsciously helps you create it faster. I think so too. It feels that way for me. And sometimes it's just one word. Mm -hmm. So for over a year, I was working on receiving. And so I just had the word receiving. I made it almost look like there was a sun behind it. So like a starburst all around the word. And then I would see that every day. And then there's one I can see from where I'm sitting right now that's a little campfire. And that's a symbol for me that's like the creative fire burning within me. And so I see it every day and I think, okay, that creative fire is burning within me. And I have a lot of people who tell me, I don't know how you keep on doing what you're doing, even though you haven't gotten sleep hardly in three years. And I'll, and I say, you know, it's, it's just like that creative fire. It just keeps on burning. And then I wake up and I want to do stuff, even if I'm a little bit sleepy. I mean, if you can get more sleep, get more sleep. I am all about more sleep. I do not want to burn the candle at both ends, but if your kid only lets you get so much, you know, you do what you can what you can and you give yourself that grace, that love, that compassion that we were talking about earlier. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And giving yourself 
like, I'm just going to recap our conversation, giving yourself like by making those lists, giving yourself the option, like you yes. have options and you mm -hmm. are doing the best you can and exactly. brain dumping and journaling about what you're going through and having that be okay. Some days it can be dark. Some days it can be one word or mm -hmm. yes. I love that you were speaking to the affirmations, putting even just one word and decorating it and it keeps you going. That's your motivation for the month, for the year. Yes. <laughs> I love, yes. I love that. And yeah, the biggest piece is receiving help. I think mm -hmm. I'm going to take away from this is it's okay to ask for help. Definitely. Asking for helps helps everybody. It does. <laughs> and it takes a village to be a mom. It took a village yes. back then too, even though I didn't know my mom didn't show it very well, but it, right. took, but it definitely does. And so I love this conversation so much, Rachel, I would love for you to speak to our listeners about where they can support you, where they can connect with you. Yes. Oh, I would love that so much. So I'm on a lot of the social platforms, YouTube, Instagram, follow me there. Those are the two that I'm on the most, but I'm also on LinkedIn, Pinterest, blah, 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 whatever. <laughs> I, I'm not on every platform, but <laughs> I send out an email every week with creative ideas to get you going, journal prompts and handout that I've created with doodles and fun things to fill in. So if you go to my website and they're, they're, right on there there'll be a place where you can sign up and it's a creative problem solving workbook and then every week you'll get freebies from me so that would be fun and that's at rachelstravelli.com and i would love to keep on supporting y'all helping make life more fun as a mom because you know we know there's going to be some challenging moments but the fun moments make it even more worthwhile. So I'm here for all of that with all y'all. Yes. So yes, before we go, I would love if there's anything on your heart that you feel called to share as a final thought on your heart. Um, we, oh. I like to well, see. one thing I was thinking, I know some people might not be list makers and I don't really consider myself a list maker per se, but what I will say is that when times are challenging, there does seem to be a little bit of security and comfort in a list. And, you know, with the pandemic, we have had some challenging times and then global events that keep on happening. And who knows, probably will something will happen in the next few months that we'll be like, well, isn't that the thing I never expected? And so what I love about a list is if you get yourself in the habit of brainstorming and making creative lists, you don't ever feel that you have no options and you don't ever feel like, okay, that's it. I'm done. No to turn. There is no help. There is no hope mm -hmm. because I don't want you to ever feel that way. It's not true. It's okay. If you feel that way for like 30 seconds <laughs> or maybe a minute max, but then remember us, remember this podcast and remember that you can find new options. You can open and see new possibilities that you haven't seen before. And that's one of the things that my workbook is designed to help you see your problem or the problem from a couple different angles so that, oh, if I see it differently, it opens up new ways that I could approach it. And then it can start to give you hope like, okay, this is doable and maybe we can even make it fun. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I love that. The last takeaway is that writing a list, even if you're not a list maker, is more of a brainstorm to mm -hmm. show you that you have options. You're not stuck. We all exactly. have exactly. We all exactly. have options. Is sometimes when you're trapped in that box of like that situation or the circumstance, you're just so close to it that you can't see it. But the moment like you allow yourself to get that pen to paper and just do a few breaths, like relax into it and just let yourself flow and whatever comes up and without that judgment, just let it come up. If it works great, if it doesn't work, at least you're putting it to paper, right? Exactly. Exactly. Definitely. And like any creative brainstorm, you, you just put all the ideas, even if they're outlandish. And then if you can get a few, you know, 10, you'll start to think, okay, one of these might 
can't be good. Yes, I love that you said that because it's so true that we are so quick to judge what goes up mm -hmm. before we even get the next one coming out. We're like the first one. Mm -hmm. like, hey. but like you're saying, <laughs> like you're saying, if it doesn't matter what comes out, and if that land is just let it be, just keep going. And oh yeah. Take just even a couple from that list, then you've won. <laughs> exactly. I'm reminded. I, this is one little quick thing. Of one time I was making a list about when I think it was when the stuff was happening with my son and we felt like it was a struggle and what would happen is he'd be awake for many hours in the night and then he'd fall asleep but I still had to get up and get my other kid ready for school mm -hmm. and so I even put on my list do we need to hire somebody to come to the house <laughs> at 6 30 wake up the kids get them dressed feed them breakfast and get them to school and, and I thought, I really don't know if I could find somebody to come for just two hours of work, especially like that thing. But even just thinking, if I got desperate enough, I would do that. And I would find someone who would do that. And he, and, and my husband was like, this is crazy. We are not going to do this idea. But for me thinking, this is my last option if I need it. Just knowing, okay, I got an ace of an option that we could do if we get really desperate. Oh, I love that illustration and that visual that you just painted for us. <laughs> that was so good because it's like, it's so true. If the, if the worst comes to the worst, I have this. Like light right. into the tunnel. Yeah. It's not all dark down there. <laughs> Oh, such a great conversation, Rachel. Thank you so much for sharing with us how you're able to use doodling and journaling and list making to give yourself options and how mamas need to ask for help and support. I think mm -hmm. that's such a big topic and so important, the work that you're doing. And I applaud you and I appreciate you being a guest today and having this conversation with us. Oh, it was so much fun to be here. Woohoo! <laughs> Keep it up fun. <laughs> Thank Making you. It fun. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to the Make Life Fun podcast. I am so filled with joy to have you here. If this show resonates with you, I have a gift for you. If you're feeling stuck, this freebie may be just what you need. I believe that if you know your why, it helps you get unstuck quicker. So to connect with your heart and know your why and figure out what it is that is most important to you, get the freebie. It's in the show notes. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast to get notifications each week. To support the show, you're invited to leave a tip in the tip jar. Information for all this is in the show notes. Sending love and light to the spirit listening to this today. Be blessed. <laughs>